this is lesson four in our first chapter, People and Government. In this, in this lesson, we're going to talk about the basics of three economic theories. We talk about economics. Economics is best to be studied intensely on its own, and then you'll understand a little bit more about how governments and economies are intertwined. But in this lesson, we're going to go over just the very basics. Uh, economics is the study of how human efforts um, are used or performed to try to fulfill unlimited wants, even though there are limited resources, right? So it's the idea that we always have limits of time and money and, and other resources like fresh water. And so how we decide to use the resources that we have and who makes those decisions is really what defines an economy. Um, governments are involved in economic affairs and at all levels, in all countries, governments play some type of influence in the economy from very, very limited to very controlled. All economies, no matter what country you live in, have to make economic decisions. And the basic decisions that they are really making are what to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. What am I going to produce? In North Korea, they really focus on military output instead of toys and an abundance of food. How do you do it? For whom are those products meant for? When you begin to really take a look at how each country answers these questions, you'll truly understand more about the economic system. So what are basic economic systems? Well, we can really oversimplify this into three major types of economic systems. Capitalism, socialism, and communism. And in this lesson, the fourth lesson in chapter one, I'm going to just talk about capitalism. In the next lesson, um, lesson five, I'll talk about socialism and communism. Capitalism. When I think about capitalism, and when you think about capitalism, the first thing that probably comes to mind is freedom of choice. Now, in a pure capitalistic society, we tend to see private ownership of all property, free enterprise, pure competition between businesses, and freedom of choice. Now, here in the United States, we don't use pure capitalism, and most countries don't. Um, some countries, um, like Singapore, um, are, are more aligned with pure capitalism than others. America used to be. America's changed a lot in the last hundred years, though. Uh, but just to kind of give you an idea, you're probably wondering why in the world I have a picture of Charmin toilet paper uh, that I took from their website. Well, when I think of competition and ownership and profits, I know it's kind of weird, but I think of the toilet paper aisle at Walmart, right? Have you ever had to go grocery shopping, maybe on your own or, or with an adult, and you look down that, that aisle of paper products? First of all, you realize they usually have two aisles of paper products tissue paper, right, toilet paper, and like uh, Kleenex tissues to blow your nose are usually in one aisle, and they have a whole aisle of paper towels. Now, that is really characteristic of an economy that's very free. There are so many choices of a paper product that you're actually going to use in the bathroom and flush away that there has to be an entire aisle of choices. You can buy single rolls, double rolls. You can buy packages of four. 8, 16, the mega pack rolls when you're going camping and eating lots of chili. Right, there's all different types of variations of amount of toilet paper as well as the softness and thickness, right? They, the, you know, the Scott's tissue pa toilet paper is a little bit thinner uh, but lasts a lot longer. The Charmin tends to be really thick and fluffy with several layers, but you use it much uh, more quickly. They have some with printed patterns, like, like paper towels as well. You can get seasonal paper towels, or you can get Christmas patterns and summer 4th of July patterns. That is capitalism. There is somebody who came up with an idea and marketed it to us that we needed this particular type of paper towel or toilet paper 
so much that sometimes we're willing to pay extra for the extra softness. That's competition, right? You can go and buy anything you want. Up until the COVID um, issue in, in 2020, you never had to worry about there being toilet paper in the aisle. There was an abundance of toilet paper. In fact, when, when the COVID scare um, hit and we all hunkered down in quarantine for a while, one of the very first things that there wasn't an abundance of was toilet paper. And people were appalled by that. They were so upset that people would hoard toilet paper or that the production line couldn't keep up with demand. That Those aren't things we typically see in America, right? And for weeks, I know I went to the grocery store and you might not even see any chicken for sale or there were, they were all out of eggs and butter or the flour was limited. We are not used to seeing those type of shortages in capitalistic societies because businesses make money when they have a product to sell and they convince us that we should buy that product, right? So, I mean, if you really just think about some of the only experiences you've had, I mean, even when you go to get orange juice, there's all types of orange juice, right? And then if you, if you aren't satisfied with one business, you can go find another business that sells a similar product and buy from them. That's competition. That keeps prices more competitive. That's what we tend to see more aligned with um, in America. So where exactly did capitalism come from? You might not think about this because um, for most of you, you've grown up in a system of capitalism or at least a variation of a mixed market capitalism. Well, these ideas really be, began to develop inside of Europe right around the time period where there was a little bit more of an abundance of food and people began to realize that they could buy food and then they could begin to specialize in something that they were good at, like artisans with uh, goldsmithing or people who were able to uh, work as seamstresses and make clothes or people who were able to build really good thatched roofs realized that they could work for economic gain, that they could specialize in something they were knowledge about, knowledgeable about or something that they could do well. And then they could actually accumulate wealth and then they could go buy their food or they could buy furniture for their homes. But they also began to realize they could use this wealth aggressively, that if they made extra money, perhaps they could um, use it to make more money, like buying tools for building homes so that we could uh, do things quicker or uh, being able to invest in in the trade market, right? The mercantilists, right? Being able to invest in trade or owe a, own a profit of a company that was trading overseas, and so this began to really develop and take off. And at first, there was just really two people: those who had the money to make investments, and those who did not. But over time, as capitalism was allowed to work out some of its problems in uh, Europe and and especially in the United States in, in the industrial boom era, it allowed free market competition to really create a lot of wealth and we begin to see the growth of the middle class. The middle class didn't exist before this. It all, you know, history had always been a story of people who were born into wealth or who inherited wealth and those who were born poor and the, and the majority of people um, you know, before the dawn of capitalistic profit ventures um, were of the latter group. They didn't have much. They were subsistence farmers. They were barely uh, making enough money to feed themselves. They were growing enough crops to feed themselves. Capitalism is going to change this. And one of the thinkers, you know, and I wouldn't say that Abbott invented capitalism, but he writes a lot about it in the Wealth of Nations in 1776, and he advocates for a system where the government just leaves it alone, laissez-faire. Just let the market work, let the market correct itself, let businesses compete with each other, and that kind of becomes the hallmark of capitalism. So we tend to think of Adam Smith today as the father of capitalism, even though he didn't invent it. He was very influential with his writings right around an important time period in American history called the American Revolution. Okay, that is the end of lesson four of chapter one, People in Government. This was Social Studies with Mrs. Johns.